All right, so now for what we are really here for. If you'll excuse me, I have a few notes that I, I need to refer to. Um, it, it's really my pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Sergio Gonzalez. Dr. Sergio Gonzalez is an assistant professor of Latinx studies in the Department of History and Languages, Literature and Cultures, a historian of 20th century U.S. immigration, labor, and religion. His scholarship focuses on the development of Latino communities in the U.S. Midwest. He is a professor at Marquette University, and we are so thankful that he's made time for us uh, to come and have this amazing discussion with Mr. Jesus Salas. So with that, I'm gonna give the stage to Sergio. Muchas gracias. Good afternoon, it is the afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with us uh, today. It's, it's so nice to look out into the crowd and to see friends, uh, students, uh, activists, members of this history we're gonna be talking about here today. And so I wanna start off by saying thank you for everyone for taking some time to, to share this space with us today. It's uh, really a distinct honor to be here with you and to share this stage with someone who I've known for over 20 years now. Uh, Jesus and I have known each other since uh, I was a, a young kid chasing my mom around doing immigrant uh, and union activism here in Milwaukee. Um, and I suppose that when I was young, I never thought that I would find myself on the stage as a historian getting the chance to talk to perhaps one of the most important individuals in the history of Wisconsin's Latinx communities, and certainly one of the most important figures in our state's working class and union history as well. And so I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to talk with you, Jesus, a little bit about uh, your uh, journey, uh, this decades-long journey of becoming such a committed activist for so many different communities. And what I think fundamentally uh, has been one of your main missions, which is to ensure that uh, all people, but specifically people of Latino descent, uh, get to enjoy a full sense of dignity in their lives here uh, in Wisconsin. So I want to start off by saying thank you for, for joining us here today. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Sergio. And, and Sergio is right. We've known each other for uh, as young as he is. We've known each other for over 20 years. Uh, Sergio's mother, Berta, a very active member in the community, and I was a, a, a board member of Voces de la Frontera back at the uh, 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 15 years ago, and uh, Berta would bring uh, Sergio to these meetings on Saturday morning, and Sergio would, uh, would come with his bag of books and find a place somewhere in the meeting room, wherever we were uh, located, and uh, not bother anybody, he'd just pull out his books and uh, mind his own business and read uh, whatever he, his assignments were. But uh, that's how long I've, uh, I've known. <laughs> I've known Sergio, so it's really a pleasure, Sergio, to uh, share uh, in, the, uh, 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 in this podium with you. I should also add that when I started writing the legacy of the farm workers, because I speak not only of the farm workers movement as such, uh, that is of the field work that we did, but of the legacy of that is the impact that we had when, when I moved to Milwaukee to uh, help Chavez with the great boycott and then our struggles in opening up access to UWM and later to uh, UW-Madison. Uh, um, I started writing about these, uh, about these uh, uh, experiences and Sergio was kind enough uh, to read uh, my initial manuscript. So uh, 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 when uh, the book is being published by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, I, I went to that press because uh, David Giffey, one of the photographers of the that is uh, in the gallery, uh, was a, a photographer for our union newspaper, La, La Voz Mexicana, and I wanted those pictures to be tied to the story. As, uh, okay. So thank you very much for your help, oh, Sergio. That, fantastic. And we're going to talk about, I think, all of this uh, this afternoon. I, I want to start with the, the, the first piece, and I think you mentioned it when we talked about our, our, shared, our, our shared history here, which is the idea of family. It's something that kind of centers a lot of your work. It's, I think, at the center a lot of the images that people can see when they walk through the gallery. And it, of course, is at the center of the way in which you kind of think about organizing. So could yeah, you tell us a little and bit about yeah, that? Yeah, let me, let me just start by saying that just recently I was involved with the neighbor, Clark Neighborhood Square uh, in terms of getting a, uh, a mural for, uh, for Dolores Huerta down the street from, uh, from Cesar Chavez Drive, where uh, Cesar Chavez statue is uh, right in the parking lot of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of El Rey uh, 
uh, as we all have uh, have uh, seen him over the years. And I was so happy to see uh, to see uh, a recognition of the Lotus because that is the story of the farm workers. I to me it was unimaginable how Cesar Chavez could organize families uh, without uh, Dolores or how uh, 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 we could organize farm workers uh, uh, without having women organizers in our, uh, in our operations. Because at the time, as, as you know, uh, uh, Sergio, the, uh, the workforce was family. Uh, uh, if you were thinking about the over 100,000 migrants coming to, uh, to uh, the Great Lakes region from, uh, from the Texas uh, borderlands uh, uh, back when we were migrant workers, uh, 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 15,000 of us coming to the state of uh, Wisconsin, the, uh, the workforce in the, uh, in the fields were family-based. So if we went, uh, we, uh, um, um, uh, Jacobo is so correct in naming the exhibit Familias Unidas, because when I started showing him uh, uh, the uh, images of the, uh, of the farm workers movement, they're all about families. They're about women and children in the field. And, uh, and uh, uh, Familias Unidas is a very appropriate term for the attempt that we made uh, in organizing farm workers, because what we did is we organized families. And when we came, when we came to Milwaukee, one of the reasons that we had so much success is that we are we organized in the same manner, or that is, you look at the at the pictures of the uh, of the uh, of, uh, of the uh, uh, civil rights movement, the Latino civil rights movement here in Milwaukee. la misma cosa. They're about families coming together to uh, to uh, do something about their condition. Yeah. And this is a common misconception about movements, right? I, th I think it's sometimes unfortunate people focus on the individuals who are at the front of the movement. You, you mentioned Cesar Chavez, which of course he often gets so much of the, the praise and we forget the Lourdes Huerta and maybe it's we talk about Jesus Salas, but of course you acknowledge so much in your work that it was about families and large groups of people coming together. Oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And uh, my, uh, my brothers were, uh, were involved, of course, in the, uh, in the farm workers movement. I, uh, I took, the, when, I, uh, when Jacobo told me that, uh, that, Ness, uh, that Ness was in the audience, I'm sorry, there are other individuals here that I really appreciate your presence, but uh, Ness Flores, uh, uh, I wanted to come out and say hello to him because uh, 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 we've been speaking over the phone for these uh, number of years. And when we were marching, the very first manifestation that the farm workers took upon themselves to protest the working conditions uh, by marching 80 miles in 1966 from uh, Watoma to Madison, uh, Nes Flores was in law school at the time. And Nes Flores, uh, with other uh, law school uh, students, came over with a car full of sodas and drinks. And, there, and that's how we met. Uh, later on, uh, when, uh, when I came to uh, Milwaukee and we took over the United Migrant Opportunity Services, we asked for a grant from, um, from, uh, from the Office of Economic Opportunity, the Migrant Division, for uh, legal services. We had had volunteer legal services for migrants. Uh, I organized uh, 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 legal services for them while I was organizing the field. But we got a grant to do it, uh, but the OEO changed their mind. It says, no, we're not going to fund uh, uh, migrant uh, agencies, uh, legal services. Uh, you uh, collaborate those uh, legal services you have with the existing agencies. And that's when law was born. He and John Abbott started that, uh, that legal services still going on 50 years later. So, I was there. so no, there is, the Familias Unidas is, is, and I just take this opportunity just to mention, uh, because Ness is here, we, uh, we go back so many years. But uh, you're absolutely right, Sergio. It's the, uh, there is no one individual. It's Familias Unidas, and, uh, and there are a lot of uh, leaders. Salvador Sanchez, who follows me as the director of United Migrant Opportunity Service, was an organizer, and, and you know, so it's important to note that. You know. yeah, so Jacopo told us that the, this exhibit is built around kind of these three big pieces, familias, uh, activism, and education. And in many ways, you can't pull apart the different pieces, right, these three threads. When I think about education, of course, I think of youth, and I'm reminded that when you decided to form Obreros Unidos with your, with your brothers, with your, with your family, with your fellow migrants that were in central Wisconsin, you were 22 years old. Well, the... Uh the uh, the uh, my 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 granddad uh, crosses uh, the border at uh, at Piedra Negra, Coahuila, that is in Eagle Pass on this side of the border in 1906, 
as a sharecropper, and he has, uh, he has dreams of access, uh, having access to land, and uh, he does get the bounty of the land, but then the, um, the, um, the um, uh, Great Depression just dislocates uh, all, of the, all of those. Well, that's when he started migrating, so before he passes, he, he teaches my, he shows my dad how to get up here, and my dad comes up here in the 40s. My, uh, my second oldest brother in, in 1942 is born in, uh, in Hartford, Wisconsin, while they're hoeing and thinning sugar beets. And my uncle Julian uh, si signs up for the selective service uh, 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 in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and serves with the Red Arrow Division uh, in the Second World War. So we have ties to Wisconsin that go back to the, uh, to the early 40s. But the war interrupts the migration, so we don't start until, uh, until the 50s. Uh, by that time, there's six of us in the family, and mom and dad, there's eight of us, neighbors, etc., uh, 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 and other communities in what is called the Winter Garden uh, region. So we spent 10 years as migrant workers. So when we relocated, uh, um, the venue, the successful venue, was selling tacos <laughs> in uh, Watoma. My dad bought a restaurant. Uh, nobody wanted to... Um, Nobody wanted to, the, the restaurant was empty. Uh, uh, this is terrible, but it's, that's the way we got in there. The uh, B. Kitzer, the owner of the restaurant on the downtown Watoma had hung herself in the, uh, in the kitchen. And nobody from town wanted to uh, uh, take over the restaurant, but here comes these Mexicans and we thought that we could, uh, we could make a, uh, a living selling tacos there to the migrants and, uh, and hopefully to tourists over the winter. So as I'm selling tacos, these people come uh, from the Division of Children and Youth. I graduated in 61, so this is 62. And they said, you're one of the solaces that uh, was a migrant worker. Would you show us uh, uh, where the, would you take us to the migrant labor camps because we're setting up a, a daycare program. Well, between 1962 and 1965, this is before Yumas was born. We, we uh, started that demonstration program in in Red Granite, Wisconsin, and we expanded to seven centers. So we've over 150 kids uh, three years later. So when I go back to the uh, migrant labor camps to try to get the children, the parents to get the children out of the labor camps, I get a different view of uh, the migrant condition, not just as a, as a you know, migrant living in a camp and, and uh, whatever hardships we endured, but families that, that I was taking care of their children now telling me about their condition. So in 65, I didn't work in the daycare programs. UMAS is funded in 65. The activity that we had done for uh, child care results in they getting funded in the southeastern part of Wisconsin. But uh, the institute, the Poverty Institute of the University of Wisconsin gets funded the same year that, uh, that UMAS gets funded. And in 1965, we do a wage study. So now I have a real concrete idea as to exactly what are the problems of the migrant workers as far as minimum wage, as far as housing, as far as some of the problems that the workers had told me when I was taking uh, their children uh, in the daycare centers. Now I have some ideas. So we're we're going over the uh, we're going over the report uh, with Professor Brandeis Rauschenbusch, uh, the pro the professor who was running the uh, the migrant study, and somebody comes up with a a a, a, um, a, uh, a newspaper from California. He says, uh, "Look at the farm workers. You're a farm worker. You were a farm worker. Yes. Look, look what they're doing. It was Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta marching from Deleno in the in uh, in the spring of uh, of uh, of 60, uh, 65 and 66 on grape strike. And I said, "That's what we need to do. We need to do it with Cesar." So I got on the phone, and at that time, Sergio, I know it's unbelievable. There used to be operators on the phone system. <laughs> Person to person call Cesar Chavez. And, just and, cold, you just cold yeah, call yeah, them. No, no, they're all called. They don't have any operators. But, but they, you know, and they, they didn't find the person that you were calling person to person. You didn't have to pay, right? Uh, later on, we found ways of how to call each other without paying. But anyway, through phone. But uh, they found Cesar Chavez, and, and I, I said, uh, we wanted to use that banner. Look how crude that farm workers banner. That was one of the first banners that we, I said, we're gonna, we want to march like you guys are doing. Uh, and, uh, and he took me up and he says, hey, but you know, he says, well, you can use the banner, but would you help us in the great boycott? And I didn't even know what a boycott was. And uh, 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 he explained to me why there was a need uh, uh, for a, a boycott because the farm workers weren't covered uh, uh, by the National Labor Relations Board uh, 
And then anytime they made a petition to improve the work and the living conditions, they simply got fired. So he and Dolores Huerta had designed the boycott. And that, he says, will you help me with the grape boycott? And I did. So all the years that I spent in the fields, we're boycotting grapes for uh, Fort Caesar up until 68 when I actually do it full time and move to uh, Milwaukee. And so from the, from the origins of the movement, 66, you cold call Cesar Chavez, you say, hey, can I borrow the Thunderbird? Yeah, yeah. And his only prerequisite is, you got to help with this little thing I'm starting. Yeah. This, this, well, the other you know. thing he said, said Hugh, that uh, it was a grape and wine boycott. Uh -huh. He says, do you know that you guys drink more wine than anybody else per capita in the United States? Here in Wisconsin. Said, Here in Wisconsin. Here with, and the brandy. And, and, yeah, well, wine and brandy. And yeah. I said, well, I don't know how many uh, uh, wine and brandy drinkers we're going to stop them from drinking. <laughs> But I, I think, we, you know, we'll try it with the grapes, and we did. We reduced over 40% of the shipment of grapes over the five years that we did that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, it strikes me that from the beginning in, in 66 when you're organizing in Watoma, it's a, it's a very local movement because you're talking about families that you know that you've met through your work, but it's also a national movement almost at the beginning. Well, the, it's a transnational movement because the, uh, the uh, and first of all, you know, this thing about you're only 22 years old. I had already spent 10 years with a lot of these workers that I had, uh, you know, they knew me as a trabajador uh, como uh, ellos. And then the, the three years, como se llama, in, uh, in uh, uh, trying to get their kids out of the fields and into the camps, you know. So I'd known them through, the, through uh, that. And then the last year, uh, doing the study, uh, 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 so that you know, uh, that's what explains you know the 22-year-old leading a march. You yeah, know, the, the, fan, support, the fancy you know. term we use is the relational organizing. They right. knew you. They knew you really well. Yeah, they trusted right, right, you. Right. Yeah, we were all farm workers, and all of the organizers that we got were farm workers. I, you know, the other part of the transnational movement, and you know, uh, Lupe Rodriguez's kid, uh, Mark Rodriguez, uh, a professor. It ends up writing this book, uh, 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 the Texas uh, uh, diaspora. He calls our movement of these hundreds of thousands of people from the Texas borderland up as a diaspora. And he calls it uh, 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 two things. He gives it a name, uh, the, uh, the uh, transnational movement, because the organizers were all uh, from the Winter Garden area, from, from Crystal City. And I can just, uh, 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 for anybody here from Crystal City, uh, 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 Rodolfo Palomo, Francisco Rodriguez, Panchito Rodriguez, uh, Ezequiel Guzman, all of these here were organizers for the farm workers movement. Then they later went back to Texas and led the political revolt in Crystal City and in the uh, surrounding areas. Francisco Rodriguez became the first Chicano uh, city manager of our hometown. When he, uh, uh, his tenure was over, Ezequiel Guzman, the other organizer of Veros Unidos, uh, was, uh, uh, followed him. The teachers, there was no bilingual teachers in those three years uh, when we were organizing the daycare centers. We went down to Texas, and I couldn't offer anybody a job because every time I had no authority, but I would communicate them with the Division of Children and Youth, and they would hire them. And there's another half a dozen members of, uh, of the Winter Garden area who became uh, crucial in, in, uh, in uh, sustaining the uh, early daycare and child care program. So yeah, not only is it Familias Unidas, it's a transnational movement, and these individuals are, are crucial for the success or the, that we had, the immediate success that, uh, that we enjoyed right off the bat. Yeah. So the migration is happening at, at different scales. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about, of course, people often think about migrant farm workers as moving just for work, but of course, you're discussing here migration for activism. There's migration happening between Texas and Wisconsin. There's the conversation you're having with California. And then after 67, 68, you come to Milwaukee, you bring that activism here as yeah, well. Yeah, we, we marched in 66 and we went out on strike in, in that, that fall. Then in 67, we took on the multinational living, you know, living. Some people said, Jesus, you should have gotten your foot on the ground and organized some of the local processors, como se llama, before taking on the multinational. And he says, yeah, but the multinational was vertically integrated with the processors and canning, tenían tres fábricas in Hartford, in Janesville, and in Jackson, Wisconsin. So uh, uh, we wanted to move from the agricultural fields into the processing and canning operation. But we took the canning, and we, I, I had no experience as an organ. I knew nothing about the labor law and that. Uh, I, there are two things that I knew. You, you get recognized for a union by having the majority of the workers sign one, or getting them to an, a certified election by the Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission and having to vote for the union. 
Well, uh, uh, the Burns Potato Processing Company in the first strike in the, after the, the march got wind of what we were doing, and uh, he called all the workers in his plant to sign an affidavit that they didn't belong to the union. And if they didn't sign, they were fired. So not only were we losing workers, some of them said that they were a member of the union, got fired on the spot. Others wouldn't sign it, which Burns thought to uh, you know, say, well, that's because you don't sign because you belong to the union. Anyway, he threw all these workers out of the labor camps. All of a sudden, we had dozens of families out in the street. And, uh, and the deputy sheriff is removing them uh, forcefully. Uh, the sheriff of Portage County saves the day. Uh, I tell them that there's a, 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 um, a checkoff where they're paying a couple dollars a, a, a week for their, for their housing and that they can't, be, uh, they can't be thrown out for 30 days. So the strike only lasts as long as we can accommodate the, the workers uh, before they get thrown out. So in the following years, well, we're not going to go on strike and you know, run into, you know, Libby has almost 700 workers. Uh, 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 we'll do a walkout. Right, uh, so we organized with, uh, now we had uh, these organizers from Cristal, I wasn't there by myself like I was the first year, and, uh, and we had the walkout, but we went right back in there and we called for an emergency election. Uh, uh, and we won the election, there were 413 votes. There were uh, children under, uh, under uh, uh, 12 weren't allowed to vote, of course, and I didn't make a big deal about it, but in reality, so only 413 were allowed to vote. We won 405 to eight, unanimous. I was sure that those eight uh, individuals that voted against the union were errors, all right? So first negotiating session with Libby and Nell, Libby, este, como se llama? the, the uh, Libby told us, we don't have to negotiate you. We're moving all, all of operations from the cucumber out of the state. And uh, we, 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 don't have a, we don't have any need for cucumber harvesters, and, uh, and we don't have to negotiate with you. So we sued them for unfair labor practices. We eventually won in the fact that they had to let us know we were their union. They had to offer us the job wherever they were taking them. They had to involve us in the process. What was going to happen with the workers? But it took months, it took years for this thing to solve. And the next year, what happened? No cucumber, 700 people lost their job. So, not, you know, very sad experiences. You know, I feel horrible, as you know. But the workers at Tandantos and Cabron, I'm sorry, they're not in Ohio. <laughs> They, they will continue to organize, We're working for other plants and that. So in 68, let's take on Libby uh, processing plants. So we went and organized all three of their canning companies and had walkouts to force them to come back to the negotiating table. Well, hey, Salas can organize canning companies, not just field workers. And so the meat cutters and the Teamsters union say, hey, we want to get involved también. They says, no, we're an unaffiliated union. So then I started having problems. Uh, Schmidt, the president of the AFL-CIO, says, Jesus, you can't just continue to be an unaffiliated union. Chavez had already joined the AFL-CIO, and we, we, uh, we, uh, I wanted to go back to Cristal and, and, and the Winter Garden area and continue the politics. And if I affiliated myself with the union, they'd have me organizing 12 months a year. At that time, uh, 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 both of my brothers uh, were in uniform. And uh, 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 um, they said, ended up, my wife had three, three of her brothers were in, uh, in, uh, in uniform, and two of my brothers saw one family, cinco veteranos during the Vietnam War. And, uh, and uh, not me. I knew that the war was, uh, was, uh, was a poor man's war, and I opposed the war. Yes, they, and I wanted to continue. Chavez says, no, you can't oppose it. There's a lot of uh, migrants that have families uh, uh, in, in uniform, and... Uh, 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 we don't want to uh, go there, as the, but eventually he came around, uh, and he, uh, in the early 70s, he did support our efforts, but we continued to be unaffiliated, and I think that uh, it weakened us because we didn't have the resources, como se llama, uh, of an affiliated union, but, uh, but we had a lot more flexibility as to what we could do. Finally, Chavez says, look, you've been at it four years, and, uh, and you haven't got a contract. Why don't you help us in California? Move to Milwaukee, where there's a strong labor uh, support, and help us organize the great boycott. When we win in California, we'll come and help you in Wisconsin. 
¿Quién iba a saber? Who was to know that it was going to take you five years of boycotting before the first contract? But I believed him, so here I come to Milwaukee to organize the, the, great, uh, the great boycott. And that's when I ran into Yumas. Uh, the issues that were going on in the fields, there were individuals that were complaining about uh, the Yumas thing, and we ended up um, challenging the board and said, look, you have all the Latinos hired, but they're all in the field. They're all community workers. All of the uh, Latino, all the administrators are non-Latinos. So we confronted the, uh, we confronted the board and the, uh, the all Anglo uh, uh, administrators got, got threatened. They thought, uh, hey, wait, the, the board might listen to Salas, you know, and uh, they asked for a contract. Yeah. They asked for a contract, and the board said, no, we're not going to give you a contract. And so they all resigned. They're thinking that the OEO was going to follow and give the money to them for them because they were the experience. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I did a thing. I said, well, what have I done? Uh, you know, here I get you know, trying to resolve an issue with humans having to do with employment, having to do with them focusing on other, because they were just a daycare center at that time. And we wanted them to focus on adult uh, uh, education and employment and training issues. And uh, no, five administrators gone. So it, I applied for the job. It was, it was a contentious moment. I mean, I've, I've looked at the, the, the newspaper records of this accusation. Some of the, white, the, the, the Anglo administrators called it the, the chili takeover. Oh, geez, they insulted us. Yeah. Yeah, really, the newspaper printed uh, our movement as the chili uh, thing. The, the uh, archbishop from Madison says, if you, if you give Salas the job and they take over, this program will fail. That was 50 years ago, and you must still go on, you know, so. Yeah, sure. So you, you've often told me that when you were in the field, uh, despite all of the contentious organizing with the employers and the, and the strikes and the walkouts, that uh, you were able to stay out of jail. But you say that when you got to Milwaukee, you couldn't keep yourself out of jail. So the tell me. You know, I, like, during that time that we were thrown out of the, uh, thrown out of the camp. Your microphone. There was, there was tension there with the police during the strikes. You know, Milwaukee was burning at the time. This was uh, the open housing marches. When we came in, uh, when we came in uh, 1968, they had, they had been marching for 200 days. And, uh, and uh, by the way, the offices for the boycott was in 524 West National. Who was there? El Centro Hispano. Father John Maurice. Father John Maurice allowed me to use El Centro offices in the back room for the boycott office. What's going on three blocks down the street? Father Grappi and the youth council's got a picket line against uh, Ellen Bradley for, uh, for uh, uh, discrimination, employment discrimination. Out of over 5,000 workers, you could count the uh, African Americans and the Latinos. So I just simply walk over there and uh, introduce myself. And I says, hey, I'm here, I'm the great boycott. And, you know, and I introduce myself to, uh, to Father Grappi and the youth council. And, uh, and then they supported me in the great boycott. Uh, we decided we were going to boycott Kroger's and Kohl's, so we're over at Kohl's, and, uh, and Grappi comes over, and he says, uh, Jesus, you're doing a tremendous job. This idea about, you know, having the, uh, the, uh, the um, choppers, uh, you know, not only not buy graves, but, uh, you know, write to the grocery, or give them the address and that, and, and, uh, you, but you've been here almost two months now, and uh, nothing's moved. Yeah, I says, you know, these guys, uh, uh, these guys are tough, man. I don't know. Well, winter's coming. We've got to do something. Well, why don't you try a little bit of direct action? And I said, what is that? He said, well, instead of just standing there and handing out leaflets, just create a little tension, you know. Well, I could see that family coming up from the, uh, from the parking lot. Go over there and stop them from coming into the store. Really? He says, yeah, just go over there and stop them, you know. Create there. And, uh, and uh, well, they'll call the cops. Well, nobody likes to come in and shop when there are police around. Well, to make a long story short, that's why I got arrested, you know. Uh, the, the, I couldn't stay out of jail. Yeah, I got thrown in jail for uh, uh, over at Coles. Uh, we got thrown in jail for the uh, one time, which is in front of Latin American Union for civil rights for no reason. They just picked me up, took me to the second district station, and then they had disrobed me. And I'm standing there bare ass just, just to humiliate me, just to, you know, uh, uh, to do that. During the uh, great boycott, of course, you know, uh, we committed civil disobedience uh, 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 there. And that, that part of the education, which is uh, noted there, is so important because after we took over the agency, you know, you must have 80 employees at that time. Father Maurice, on his own, nobody, uh, the, the, the priest who was uh, head of the archdiocese program, 
Uh, really like the idea of Latinos assuming the responsibility of providing social service. So he resigned, and he insisted that a Latino get hired. So then when we started uh, uh, getting the uh, CAP agency, the Social Development Commission, to come over and provide employment and training services here so that the Latinos didn't have to go to the downtown to get them, we actually got another Latino hired. Uh, Chacon established the Latin America. In other words, in a period of about six to eight months, there were five or six different agencies. The SPOT, the United Community Center was born uh, during this period of time. The 16th Street Clinic was born during this period of time. And so all this activity was going on. A lot of youth were involved in this, and that's where the University of Wisconsin come in. Of all the 25,000 students at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee at that time, all the Latinos could sit around one table. There weren't a dozen Latinos out of 25,000, and that's when we started. And uh, you know, I later became a University of Wisconsin regent, and the university system, they don't like to be told who to hire, what programs to establish. But we told them, we told them what we needed, and uh, that's why we, they kept us out for, for a number of years until we established what is now the Roberto Hernandez Center. Yeah. And I want to talk about UWM fights in a second, but I want to come back to this other point that you made that um, you know, you're talking with Grappi, and you're, there's very organic conversations you're having about shifting your strategies. And you, you make a really important point, I think, in all of your work, which is the interracial and the interethnic solidarity, and the way in which you, these different communities found ways to come together. Where did that come from? I mean, how did people come to the table to make these, these movements? The, the, uh, the, uh, the, even to this day, Sergio, that's very important. Even to this day, people talk either about the Latino civil rights movement or the African-American civil rights movement. I've never noted uh, anyone talk about the intersection between those two or how we join the, uh, during the welfare rights cut, you know, because the Republicans at that time thought that, uh, that the, that the African-Americans were coming here from uh, the South to get on welfare. I mean, that's, it's a racist, it's a, it's a racist view of people, right? That they came here not to work, or we, of all people, the last thing you can say about Mexicans coming to, uh, to Wisconsin, what's good, we didn't even know what welfare was. There was no welfare for us in, in Texas. So we came here to work, and when we came to Milwaukee, uh, we thought we could get a better deal in terms of, uh, of jobs. But uh, anyway, the legislature thought that uh, they should cut the safety net, uh, 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 and you must need that safety net for, to be able to uh, uh, relocate uh, the thousands of workers who were being displaced uh, uh, in the field, and some of them voluntarily coming into uh, into uh, work. So that interaction, uh, we joined. The, the, the welfare rights protests were a combination of uh, the uh, north side and the south side activity. So the intersection there uh, with Grappi and I and the, uh, and the youth council. By the way, they arrested us at, uh, at the uh, at, uh, uh, takeover of the Capitol. Yeah, to, to be fair, yeah. you did take over the assembly hall yeah. of the Well, we the didn't know. We didn't, we didn't intend to do it. We just stayed there too long. But you know, <laughs> this, no really, we had no intent. As soon as, as soon as we wouldn't leave, they called the National Guard with fixed bayonets to remove us from. What are you talking about? I've never seen, I've never seen, and you know, this kind of thing to get us out. Uh, and they stayed there. And of course, you know, with the student, it just provokes the, uh, creates a different atmosphere uh, uh, for the, uh, for the process. No matter how, how uh, uh, you're committed to uh, uh, peaceful nonviolence, you know, that confrontation that, uh, that uh, bringing the, the National Guard with armed, they were armed. They, you know. And they so, called for your arrest the very next oh, day. Oh, well, they, 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 what happened was uh, the legislature arrest, uh, called for the arrest of Grappi, and then uh, the federal judge says, no, you can't arrest a, a citizen from, you know, the legislature has no authority to arrest. So then they sued us. For $25,000, Grappi, myself, and three other welfare uh, leaders, you know, uh, you owe $25,000 for the damages to them. There was no damage. We were just super careful not to uh, damage another property during the, that one-day uh, 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 protest. But then Chacon here in the, uh, in the uh, protest, because the protest went on here, he and Puente get arrested for coming to the aid of a pregnant woman who was being beat up by, uh, by a, 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 a police, and it's on camera. They take a picture of it. They get sentenced to uh, six months in jail. And when we look over the tape that wasn't admitted, admitted in, uh, in, in court, 
uh, uh, it doesn't show that. It doesn't show that uh, that they uh, hurt the, or they they removed the policeman, maybe a little forcefully, uh, in order to get rid of him because he was hitting the woman with a baton. But uh, but uh, uh, they didn't deserve the six months. So then we changed the focus and we started free Chacon and Puente, and we got the governor Lucy to issue a pardon, unheard of. Este, but we knew that we couldn't leave Chacon in jail. You know. Yeah. So. Well, the, the thing that's wild to me, Jesus, is you, you talk about you, you, this is all within one or two years. This is all happening, right? You, you're on so many different fronts. These organizations are trying to fight because these are all things that affect Latinos and black Milwaukeeans and poor, poor white Milwaukeeans as well, right? I mean, there's so many facets of their life. Let's talk a little bit about the UWM, the focus on, on education. For you, of course, you mentioned how in the early 60s, this is where you got a lot of your start doing the early child care work. And so education had always been kind of at the heart of what you were doing. In 6970, you and other activists shift towards looking at higher education and think about the pipeline that's available for students. What, what's the decision making? The, uh, the, well, at that time, we knew exactly what we wanted. All of, these, all of these agencies that the Latinos were taking over here that I mentioned, or a lot of them were young folks. A lot of them were people of my age or not very much older than myself. And, uh, and that, in order for us to really be effective in providing the social services that we were promising the community that we intended to deliver, we needed that. We needed uh, UWM. In other words, th these jobs had qualifications. Qualifications, a lot of them had qualifications for college. A lot of them had a bachelor's degrees uh, uh, that you needed. They needed to be uh, 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 in order to hold or to direct these agencies. Uh, uh, so UWM was integral. And we weren't about to, uh, we weren't about, once we started the fight, it's just like the farm workers, it took us five years, we weren't about to give it up, and they knew that. But they had never been confronted with that kind of, uh, of, uh, of demonstration before that was there month and year after year. And one of the things that we wanted was a program. And, uh, and we did not simply just admit us into the UWM. We, we at that time, uh, um, uh, what, what, the Dr. Fernandez was teaching at Marquette, and we wanted him to be the director of that. And, uh, eventually, they eventually found out that it was uh, Dr. Fernandez who we wanted to be uh, uh, head of that. But we wanted an institute. We wanted an institute to come over to the South Side, to have offices here, to provide educational service, academic support services, uh, uh, um, uh, services for financial aid. Everybody qualified for financial aid. So... Uh, that's what uh, the resistance. They would allow us to come in, but they wouldn't give us a program. They wouldn't set up an advisory committee for the program. They wouldn't have us uh, uh, have the person that we wanted to be hired. That's what kept us apart. That's what made it a multi-year effort. What's amazing is you just the, the organizers developed the curriculum, the structure of the program. I mean, you come to the university with everything kind of set. You say, "Here, we've developed everything that you need." The structure. To well, they didn't know place. anything about teaching adult education to people with. Uh, uh, where uh, English is a second language. We're the ones who were, were that's, you know, the, school, the dean of the School of Education was aware of what was going on in the South Side. He supported us, and I think that that, when we started organizing, we organized, you know, the whole campus. And even though the problem was with the chancellor, we, were, we had letters from uh, the, the dean that he would be supportive of establishing uh, the Spanish-speaking Outreach Institute. He would be willing to hire individuals for the. We have uh, letters from uh, our faculty and staff from Mellencamp Hall, or that is from financial aid, et, et cetera. So uh, we organized around the chancellor's office. And I don't think that they had ever seen that before. Uh, and the same thing we did uh, was at UW Madison later on. Uh, 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 uh. But that's the way we learn how to organize in the field, and that's why we organize here. And I think it, it, it did two things. When we organized families here in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in Milwaukee, we organized a youth movement also, because Chacon and his uh, activities, all of a sudden we had demands for recreational services. The spot was created to provide recreational, UCC, the precursor to the spot, mm -hmm. to create uh, uh, recreational services for the, for the youth that we had organized. Why? Because we organized families. And women, women too. And, and uh, this is something that, that is not in the books, but... Uh, 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 we concluded the establishment of the Spanish-speaking outreach institute in the uh, 
in the, uh, uh, at the end of 1969. In January 1970, we were having a meeting at the University of Wisconsin. Hundreds of people, I think there's pictures of those uh, in the gallery, if not here, over at, uh, Salud, at, uh, at uh, uh, MSOE. There's hundreds of people in the audience, and I'm at the podium. I'm at the podium. Uh, 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 behind me is Dante, uh, 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 and he, uh, he and I are, uh, are talking about the strategies that we're going to have for the Spanish-speaking Outreach Institute. Then coming from the top row, there's a bunch of women dressed in, uh, in uh, Mexican uh, 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 blouses and rebosos, and that is what's going on. They march up to the podium, and they take the microphone for me. And, and uh, to make a long story short, they, they, make a, they have a statement. They want to have a caucus, a women's caucus. Can you believe that? They don't <laughs> think. And they get up there and they say, we're not going to take this crap anymore from all of you uh, macho leaders. And they're talking to me and they're talking to Chacon and they're talking to Lalo Valdez and they're talking to all the male leaders of the movement for the last, uh, you know, uh, that they've been helping now for the last several years, and they said they're not going to take it anymore unless you join, unless you allow us to be part of the process. And they give this example: every time we have a political manifestation, and he says, uh, "You guys will go over to Rasos or to Conejitos Bar." And at that time, at that time, women were not allowed. Chicana women were not allowed to go into those bars. I mean, in, in restaurants, uh, 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 men and women would be served uh, alcoholic drinks, but there were some bars that were primarily male, uh, all male dominated. So he says, yeah, you go after a political manifestation, you go into Rasos, and you talk about the, uh, about the day's events in there. By the time that you see us the next day, you got everything all set up for us. You do this, and you know, we're not gonna take that crap anymore. They, they used other words than just crap. <laughs> But, uh, but to make a long story short, we did. We accommodated, we accommodated them. There is a, uh, a caucus, an all-Latina caucus at the university. We, uh, we adjusted the, uh, the, um, the agenda. And then at the, uh, they presented their demands at noon, where it was uh, scheduled uh, as part of the all-day activities, a noon luncheon. And, uh, and, <laughs> and here they are reading, uh, reading all their demands from, uh, from the, the caucus. So, the fact that you organize families in the urban areas, uh, Sergio, was th one, of the, one of the reasons why there was a youth movement, there was a demand for youth services, recreational services, and that we had this manifestation of women this day also at, uh, in 1970 uh, at Humus. I'm gonna ask you one last question because I see Jacobo getting ready to, to shift us to the Q&A here. Okay. Th the whole focus, I think, of, of, your, of your book and of, of these, uh, uh, of these amazing exhibits here at MSOE is, of course, is the question of legacy, right? I mean, you're, you're kind of looking back and thinking about this, uh, this long history that you've described. We are now in 2022, two years removed from uh, the protests after the murder of George Floyd and kind of the uprising in urban spaces across the United States. This summer, of course, we're beginning to see mass unionization drives across the United States at places like Amazon and Starbucks, right? So kind of this new sense of activism, of labor activism specifically. What are, what's the lesson or one of the main lessons you want people to understand of this long history as we think about the future? Well, the, 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 if, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, when you, when you look at the, at the timeline of these activities, I go back to, I go back to the labor camps to uh, get, uh, uh, for the daycare programs from 1962 until 1965, while well, 65 being the Brandeis uh, Poverty Institute study on wages and working conditions. And, and uh, I finished my work uh, when I come here, in 68 and 69, uh, 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 you know, one of the things say, hey, Jesus, you know, you came here to Milwaukee to take over this job. That's why you got involved with humans. I said, you know what? I'll only stay for one funding period. You think I want to be a bureaucrat? Uh, uh, you think that's what I want to see my life as? And I'll only stay, I said, for one funding period. And I did. I only stayed to get that program. You was funded that one year. I was afraid we were about to lose the whole doggone grant. And so I only stayed that year to get it funded in one more year, and I left. Uh, 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 but I think the, uh, the um, if you use the university, which was a, the more massive one of the, you know, education being one of the aspects of the gallery, we, 
we, you know, there were all, only there were a dozen Latinos in 1968 when we started this, uh, and now what? Uh, Alberto is here, he can correct me. There's over 2,000 students, and I don't know how many hundreds, he just mentioned it to me, I just happened, I don't want to give you an incorrect, hundreds of them graduating, and you know, UWM is really unique because the majority of those graduates are going to stay here. So, so we have a tremendous uh, 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 future uh, with these individuals. We really uh, 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 should be all very proud of that. But look, you have 2,000 students rather than just a dozen. But look what is, what is, what is left. Let, uh, uh, undocumented students, children of undocumented uh, 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 families do not qualify for financial aid. What future do they have? They don't, uh, they have to pay out of state tuition. Now, when I was a member of the Board of Regents, I made that a point and, and we did pass a resolution to alleviate that, but then Walker came in and, and rescinded that. But, uh, but yeah, they're still out there. We still have needs out there, even though we say, oh, we got 2,000 students. Yeah, but the job isn't finished when, when uh, a part of our community is not getting the services from, uh, from UWM. Uh, uh, the driver's license thing is something that happened between when we started the movement and right now. You know, you, you can't, uh, you know, undocumented uh, uh, individuals cannot uh, uh, get driver's licenses. At 287G, where the sheriffs are, are given authority of, uh, of uh, ICE, so that is an immigration officer that come in and arrest and jail and actually ruin the whole process of uh, legalization by jailing and, uh, and uh, getting these individual families to have a record just simply because they don't have a driver's license, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, even though we can talk about our accomplishments throughout our community, there continues to be. During the, the last four years of, uh, of uh, this predecessor, you know, we got no cutback. We got no funding. As a matter of fact, there was cutbacks uh, at, at IRS so that there wouldn't be any investigations so the rich boys uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, make uh, all of these uh, big, uh, big uh, dollars. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the programs, most of the programs, social service programs, we're not, uh, we're not increase, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So we're behind the eight ball. We're still, there's still a lot of need to continue the activities of the agencies that are here, the UMAs, the UCC, uh, et cetera. We're very proud of the activities that they have going, but, uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done. There's, there's some finished work, too. La lucha sigue. Well, before we go to the q and I just want to thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to, to share this space with you. And I'm sure everyone appreciated the opportunity to hear a little bit as well. Thank you. So now we would like to open it up for Q&A. So if you have a question for Mr. Salas or Dr. Gonzalez, uh, please raise your hand. I'll come to you. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Actually, Sergio, Sergio uh, has, uh, has published uh, Mexicanos in Wisconsin. Uh, 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 it's a tremendous, uh, a tremendous history that was, uh, that was needed to uh, talk about how long, uh, and we talk about late 19th century arrivals. Uh, I speak of, uh, of uh, my parents coming up here in, in the 40s. Uh, people don't realize how long we've been coming to Wisconsin, the contribution. We changed the household industry to a national powerhouse in, uh, in, the, uh, in the agricultural production of a uh, whole variety of fruits and vegetables. And, the same thing, our contribution here to key industries in the, uh, in the city of Milwaukee uh, uh, should also be noted, and, and Sergio notes it in his, uh, in, his, uh, in his book. So congratulations, Sergio. Thank yes. you, Jesus. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you, Jesus, for mentioning that, because uh, while we give our audience a chance to uh, think about some questions, uh, one of the focuses, like we said, is education, right, throughout this whole exhibit and this conversation. So, um, Sergio, can you tell us how uh, we might be able to find your book, where it's uh, published? And then, Jesus, can you tell us when your book will be released this summer? Uh, th thank you, Jacobo. Uh, Wisconsin Historical Society Press, anywhere that you buy your local books, local booksellers are always better. Uh, so anywhere you buy a book, you can get a copy of the, of the book and then the Wisconsin Historical Society Press's website as well. Thank you, Jacobo. And can you give us the title one more time? The, it's Mexicans in Wisconsin, not too hard to, to remember. Mexicans in Wisconsin. <laughs> All right. And the, uh, the early, very early on, is the, is the David Giffey, one of the photographers, uh, gave hundreds uh, or deeded hundreds of his photographs to so the Wisconsin Historical Society 
And, uh, and matter of fact, when Sergio and I went up there for Hispanic Week uh, a couple of years ago, they blew up all these pictures uh, 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 of the farm workers movement for, for, that particular, for that particular event. And they're uh, raising funds for a museum and uh, they're going to make an exhibit of, uh, of uh, the farm workers' contribution to, uh, to the state of Wisconsin. So I decided to, the only, uh, the only press that I decided to, uh, to uh, have my book published at uh, was at Wisconsin Historical Society, along with, uh, with, uh, with Sergio's and David Giffey's uh, photographs, uh, some of them which you see down in the, in the gallery. Okay. The uh, we're in the process uh, of uh, editing the. Uh, there's a process. I didn't know. I thought I was all done. I was telling Sergio, do you know that this uh, editor told me that you should be you should be concerned about the readers? I didn't write for readers. No, you have to be aware. Your book is going. To, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. But I didn't write with the idea that I didn't even know that my writings were ever going to be published, let alone uh, uh, see. Well. Uh, 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 now th that's what she's doing. She's uh, she's editing the book. We're about halfway, so it should be done this fall. Uh, okay. oh, great. Okay, we have a question. Yeah, um, I actually have two questions. First of all, I would like to know what happened to your parents' restaurant in Wachama, and second, I would like to know. Um, and this is a broad question. Other Latino migrants to Milwaukee. I mean, I've got a friend who's Puerto Rican, and you know, so I, I know the Mexicans aren't the only ones here. What brought the other immigrant Latino immigrants here, and how unified have they been with the movement overall? The uh, the the restaurant went on until slave labor was unavailable to my family anymore. The uh, the children started moving out of Watoma, <laughs> and they couldn't afford to pay anybody wages, and uh, and the restaurant was sold thereafter. Um, uh, um, the uh, the uh, the majority of the migrant workers at the time that we were migrating were primarily from the Texas borderland. The uh, the uh, this is uh, I'm talking about the 10 years that I spent as a migrant worker during the 50s. The other migrant groups, the, there was a large migration. Uh, uh, Operation Brutstep brought a, uh, quite a number of Puerto Ricans coming to the Midwest, particularly from Chicago that spread out to Milwaukee. The Cuban uh, uh, migrations didn't happen until the uh, 60s. The uh, uh, migration to the Central America uh, uh, were not until a little bit later in the 70s and 80s that st we started becoming a much more diverse uh, uh, but I think that uh, people like Ernesto Chacon, and I think uh, he, the real genius, the real uh, 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 of, uh, of Ernesto Chacon was naming the organization Latin American Union for Civil Rights. In other words, m recognizing the fact that it wasn't about <coughs> just as he had been when we were out in the field, Chicano power, that kind, that we wanted to be able to address the issue uh, 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 of the diversity of the in emerging Latino community. And I think the same thing when we established uh, the program at, uh, at, uh, at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, we called it the Spanish Speaking Outreach Institute, again, it, it, to reflect the diversity at, at that time, the, the growing diversity of the Latino community, even though we had primarily been Mexicans in, uh, in the uh, farm work, uh, 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 we were very conscious of the fact that we wanted to organize the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole community, and that we had to appeal to all of them. Uh, and I think the fact that uh, that those names and those organizers uh, uh, gave it that uh, that uh, that appeal, and, and and the community responded to that. Thank you. That's a great question. Oh, go over here, and then to Roberto. During the pandemic, we heard so much about the conditions in the meatpacking industry. Um, what sort of activism is going on now there? Yes, the uh, the uh, the um, there are two there are two aspects of it. There was an attempt. There was an attempt by Voces de la Frontera to engage uh, other labor unions in in uh, uh, in looking into the matter. Uh, 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 of what was going on in the meat processing industries. Uh, United Migrant Opportunity Service was also involved in uh, getting individuals uh, uh, to respond to some of their needs, including filing 
uh, uh, cases uh, uh, of mistreatment. Uh, and some of these cases eventually uh, were class action lawsuits that uh, they grew into class action lawsuits that covered uh, the whole plant and, and eventually industry wide. Uh, but as far as a particular labor union that is organizing uh, the plants, I cannot give you that example. Uh, uh, there was an attempt uh, when we were organizing uh, the farm workers when the, the meat processing plants were actually uh, taking on jobs that were going on at the, uh, at the grocery store. In other words, doing away with the meat cutters in, uh, in, the, uh, in some of the grocery stores because that, that job started uh, 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 being made at the processing plant where they would actually sell you the, uh, the uh, meat already processed into hamburger, into pork chops, into whatever, rather than have meat cutters do that. There was an attempt by the Meat Cutters Union, the AFL-CIO, to resolve that, uh, but the, the very hard industry to uh, to uh, organize, and to this day, it re they remain uh, they remain uh, uh, unorganized uh, primarily. We have time for one more question after this one. Uh, it is not a question, but more so a thank you uh, for the conversation and for sharing, uh, Jesus, and. A couple more thank yous. Um, I mean, I, I stand here because of the efforts. Uh, I graduated from UW-Milwaukee. I benefited from the Spanish-speaking outreach. And I now get to direct uh, the center. So, thank you. Eh. Oh, and one, and one of the things, one of the things that is going on at the university, the. Uh, WTMJ and Channel 4 deeded all of their materials, including videos of, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of other videos. And the, uh, um, there's collaboration going on with University of Wisconsin and the Golda Meir Library. If you go into the website of Golda Meir and identify as Latino activism, you'll see some of the archives that are being uh, done in the work that has been done by the, by, uh, Alberto at the uh, Roberto Hernandez Center and uh, some wonderful staff members uh, that have curated these uh, individuals. There is a, a number of videos that have uh, come up, including a video that is being uh, used at the, uh, at the exhibit uh, that came out of the, uh, they sent cameras uh, in the 1966 march. I didn't even know that there was a video of the march. There's a video of uh, interviews in 1967 as such, and these are all had been stored for the last 50 years at UWM, and because of this activity that is going on at the Golda Meir Library with the Roberto Hernandez Center, there's now hundreds of photographs. None of these photographs are, are, are the ones that you're seeing down here. These are primarily of the struggle to establish the Spanish-speaking Outreach uh, Institute, and uh, congratulate uh, Alberto and uh, the Golda Meir Library uh, archivist uh, for doing all this uh, just, work. Um, just wanted to share facts, because I know you, you, <laughs> you did not want to give false information, but um, there's 20, over 2,400 Latino students that attend UWM and currently. 2000, yeah. And just this academic year, we graduated, or 512 combined graduate and undergraduate students were eligible to graduate from campus, so thank you. And congratulations, uh, Alberto. Alberto Maldonado is the current uh, director of the Roberto Hernandez Center. And I gotta tell you, when we were putting this exhibit together, he's one of the first people that I reached out. And he literally let me come into his office and take pictures off the walls. And that's what some of the pictures that you see in the gallery. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jacobo. Uh, Jesus, um, it's, it's really a, such an honor to to have you here speak, as, as well as having uh, Ness Flores, one of the legal legends here uh, uh, in Wisconsin history. Um, I wanted to ask you something about uh, the Wisconsin, the Governor's Council on, on Migrant Labor. Um, did you interact with, with you know, was that well, a the, useful the, resource? I know Ness yeah, was involved. Yeah, I mentioned, I mentioned the fact that we had gotten the original grant for legal services. Uh, it was funded after I had left the agency so that Ness was hired uh, right after I had left. The, when the uh, reorganization of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, 
or the organization of law or that is a legal action. One of the great tributes for the, um, for the contribution of Ness uh, uh, and uh, John Abbott is that uh, we became uh, dissatisfied, impatient with the uh, role of, uh, at that time, our friend Governor Lucy and the legislature. And there was a march uh, uh, from uh, Milwaukee to, uh, to Madison. At that time, after I had left Madison, I uh, uh, enrolled uh, as a graduate student at the, at the University of Wisconsin, the Department of Political Science, eventually getting my degree and spending uh, uh, 20 years teaching uh, post-secondary institutions. But at the time I, I spent in, in Madison, when, so when U.S. is marching, they have uh, on their uh, 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 Ines Flores and, uh, and John Abbott, who are uh, 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 tied to their effort. And what they want is a migrant labor law, something that, uh, that uh, we had demanded. The demands of the 1966 march is for an enforcement of, uh, of Wisconsin state uh, statutes in first minimum wage, workman's compensation, uh, 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 certified housing and that. And uh, Ness and, uh, and John Abbott actually uh, uh, developed the migrant uh, labor law that provides for all of these provisions that were in the original demands of the 1966 march and that we, uh, that we saw. And it's a tremendous, uh, tremendous piece of legislation because it says you cannot, you cannot bring in migrant workers from all the way from Texas unless you've got a place for them to stay. And that place has to be certified uh, uh, housed. And if they come all the way over here, you have to pay them the minimum wage. So they codified the whole process from, uh, from uh, bringing, uh, recruiting the, the workers from Texas to uh, housing them, to paying them minimum wage, et cetera. And uh, it is a tremendous piece of, uh, tremendous piece. And I just mentioned one piece of, uh, of legislation that they contribute. The reality of the situation is that a little, uh, 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 a year later, the, uh, the Chinese students in the San Francisco Independent School District uh, 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 take a, uh, a lawsuit to the Supreme Court, Law versus Nichols, that uh, they're not learning anything in school and that they are demanding bilingual education. So the state of Wisconsin has to pass after Law versus Nichols a bilingual education law. And uh, again, we have to depend on the expertise of our attorneys to be able to craft the bilingual law. Finally, in the, uh, in the demand for Chicano studies at the, uh, at the, uh, at the University of Wisconsin, we amended the, uh, we amended the, uh, the University of Wisconsin budget to create Chicano studies and, uh, and uh, later passed a migrant tuition bill again. The legislative, uh, and I didn't mention anything about the legislative initiatives that we undertook, but if it hadn't been for uh, Ness Flores and John Abbott for, uh, 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 for law, or that is legal action of Wisconsin, we would have never had the success that we had in establishing these uh, leg legislative initiatives in the state of uh, Wisconsin. And we owe it to Ness and to John and the whole, your whole, uh, Mario Caballero working for law was instrumental in establishing uh, the migrant tuition, uh, the precursor of the migrant tuition at that time. Uh, 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 he had worked that summer with you guys. so. Tremendous, tremendous, uh, tremendous contribution. As soon as I know that Ness was here, uh, uh, as you saw me uh, go over and, uh, and greet him, uh, I was so happy to see that, that he was going to be here today. So great to see you, uh, Ness. Uh, hopefully we'll both stick around. We're both about the same age. This is my uh, 79th year, so we hopefully we'll begin our Octagarian uh, uh, years uh, next year. So, este, saludos, un buen abrazo, Ness. Eh? Adios. You know, we're quite honored to have Ness Flores with us. I, I, I want to be respectful of people's time, but we do have one final question, and then uh, we, we'll wrap up. Uh, only that I wanted to comment that there are about uh, 10 advocates from Legal Action of Wisconsin here Perfect. today, um, and a number of them from our Migrant Law Project. So when you talk about legacy, um, you know, uh, the work that Ness and John have done, 
definitely continues in our firm. And in and the and and staff, I mentioned, I didn't, you know, don't have time for Mario Caballero, the, uh, after working a summer with you guys, uh, joined students, Mecha students, and we sponsored that bill. We, he was the lead person in the, uh, in, the uh, in other words, the, the law gave any, any, any migrant family that had worked three to five years in the fields, their children did not have to pay out of state tuition if they enrolled in the UW system. And it was, uh, it was Mario Caballero uh, 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 who led that with the support of Mecha students and got that legislation uh, passed after that summer that he had worked with you guys. So uh, uh, long, long and, uh, and very uh, extraordinary contributions for the legislative initiatives that were undertaken during that period of time are that you guys are directly responsible uh, 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 for assisting us in, uh, in developing them. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, I just want to take uh, this moment to say uh, one more time, express my immense gratitude to Jesus uh, for being such an amazing advisor and mentor uh, over the last two years as we got this uh, exhibit ready, but not only to me, but for so many youth in our community. Uh, having been such a, a stellar uh, beacon of education, you know, somebody who's led the way and continues to be such a positive example for our entire community to follow. So, and also, Dr. Uh, Gonzalez, thank you so much for being an amazing moderator. And uh, please continue to learn about this history. Uh, there's so much more to unwrap, so much more for us to learn from as we keep trying to move forward. Uh, please join me in giving them a big round of applause. Thank you all, uh, enjoy the rest of your beautiful day and thank you so much for coming out today.